You know, I begin by praising the Lord for my pastor. Um, I always like to pick out something that I thank the pastor for every time I come up here and praise God for his life. And uh, I'm thankful that he's off with his wife. And I am thankful for a pastor that we have never once, ever once had a fear or a concern about pastor and his wife's relationship and love for each other. And I want to say this, after pastoring for 25 years, and I know that I fumbled the ball sometimes from behind the pulpit about things that I don't think I should have said that. I want to tell you something. I really praise the Lord. Do you not sense pastor's love for his wife? I, I really do. When, when he talks, him and Terry, I thank God for their relationship. By the way, we ought to pray for their marriage. Oh, how Satan would like to get in between both of them. And how that that could so much in many areas uh, affect us. So every time you hear that pastor's away with his wife, that's a good thing for all of us. And that's a, just a real blessing as well. I do always count it an honor. And I do thank my pastor for the privilege to be able to speak on the last Sunday here at Lancaster Baptist. Matter of fact, let me give a little commercial about tonight if I could. Uh, and that is two, uh, two things I hope get you excited. Number one, I have a red eye flight tonight. It's an early one uh, from Delta tonight out of LAX at around 930. So one thing you know is the message will be short tonight. So that's a positive. And then I want to preach tonight on um, when I pastored up in Santa Maria, we would have a theme every year. And then I've been with seven themes here now uh, at Lancaster Baptist. And I want to tell you, I believe the greatest theme I've ever experienced as a church is the one we did this year, Alive in Christ. And tonight I'd like to preach on uh, takeaways from Alive in Christ. And it will not be long uh, because I have to get going, but I pray it'll be a, just a, I think it's been the best theme that in the years that I've been here that this church has ever had, Alive in Christ. And I want to talk to you about some takeaways from that that I think will prepare you for 2020 as well. Take your Bibles, if you have them today, a copy of the scriptures and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter number 4. 1 Chronicles chapter number four. Now, I was having my devotions. I just started First Chronicles about a week or so ago, and um, I've been doing a chapter a day, but when I got to, usually that's what I do for my devotions, and then kind of outline it, study it, whatever. But First Chronicles, the first six and a half chapters are pretty difficult because it's just basically begat, sons of, son, and a bunch of names that are very hard to pronounce. But there is an oasis in this desert. And uh, that oasis is found in 1 Chronicles 4, verse 9 and verse 10. And it really is just full of life. And you get all of these names, and it's just one name after another. And then the writer of Chronicles just stops under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and gives us this oasis, this blooming flower in the midst of this desert that is so worth our while to study at the end of the year and also as we begin. Now, uh, the title of my message is Turning Sorrow to Success. There's other ways that you could say the title of this message. You probably have heard this before. You help me out. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So maybe in 2019, you were thrown some lemons, okay? So maybe there were some lemons that, ooh. So maybe you got thrown some lemons. Whoa, there's a catch. Jesse, I know, you got a couple lemons. So maybe, are you guys ready up there in the balcony? All right. So when life throws you lemons, everyone together, what are you supposed to do? Well, I think there's a scriptural basis behind that. And that is turning sorrow to success. And we're gonna see that today in the life of Jabez. Turning sorrow to success. If I had another title, it would be 
When life gives you lemons, make lemonade or the recipe for lemonade. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to be with us. Let's read the two verses. Let's stand and read these two verses and let's read them out loud together. First Chronicles chapter four, if you don't have a copy of the scriptures, it's on your handout today. And let's read it out loud together. First Chronicles four, nine and 10. Would you join with me? And then we'll have a word of prayer, everyone together. And Jabez was... And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast and that thine hand might be with me and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Isn't that a great prayer? What a great prayer for 2020, right there in verse number 10. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this is our prayer as individuals, as families, as a church corporately. Father, I pray that you would bless us indeed, but not for our own sake, Lord. Enlarge our coast in 2020. Have us grow in our own walk with you, in our ministry to others, and as a church. Father, may we grow. And Father, we're not praying that evil will not come to us. We're praying that we will not have the sorrow of evil. That, Father, we won't get bitter or grieve over that which you bring into our life that may be a little sour at the moment, but, Lord, that can produce great lemonade for others to be blessed from and for our own lives to be refreshed. Father, I ask and pray in the Christ's name, our risen Savior, who we have been alive in Christ this year as a church, Lord, I pray that you will grant us our request. I pray that the things that we share today will be helpful. Lord, I would imagine that there are guests here today and Lord, may it, they see the providence of your hand of why they're at this church this morning from your word and from this incredible uh, example of taking sorrow and making it into success. Father, we do pray for our pastor and his wife. I pray for Paul and Terry Chapel, And I ask, Lord, that their time away would be sweet. I pray, Lord, that they would draw closer to each other and closer to you. Grant them just, may they laugh together. I was thinking, Lord, about our, uh, our, our couples retreat. May they be in sync. May they come back in sync together. And I pray for them. But Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask that you'd be with us today. We need to get something from your word and may Jabez's prayer be just what you ordered for 2020 and as we reflect over 2019 as well. And then, Lord, it is possible that there is somebody here today that has never prayed to you for salvation. Lord, the brevity of this prayer, I think it's 33 words, Lord. It doesn't take a long prayer to get saved. I ask, Lord, if there's someone here that no matter what's happened in 2019 or in their life, that today they could see the sweetness of knowing Christ as their Savior and the forgiveness of their sins. And Lord, I pray that there would be maybe a sinner's prayer today that you would answer, you always do, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. At any time during this service, if there is one that right now has not a relationship with you and is headed for hell, I pray that during this service, they would call on you to save them. Father, for the rest of us, may Jabez's prayer be exactly what we need. We ask these things in the name of the one who's going to grant us our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. I want you to see, first of all, the character of Jabez. In verse number nine, again, 
You have a list of all of these names for six and a half chapters. And then there's these two little verses that just talk about somebody. Jabez was more, everyone together, honorable than his brethren. Now, first of all, it is very rare for the Bible to ever compare one person to another. If the Bible ever compares somebody to somebody else, there is a very important reason. Jabez is now compared to all of the dozens and really hundreds of names that are in these six and a half chapters. The Bible very clearly indicates that Jabez is more honorable. Now, as we come into 2020, Everything on TV, it seems like, all of your emails, if they're like mine, all of the spam that we get and everything is about losing weight. Well, let me tell you a guy who didn't lose weight and in an area that we shouldn't lose weight. The word honorable means weighty. It means to carry a lot of weight. This is one diet we do not want to have in 2020. This is the weight of our character, of our reputation. And it says in the Bible that Jabez was more weighty than his brethren. Doesn't mean he weighed the most in pounds. It means that his character was above those that were around him. And because of his reputation and his character, it had an influence on others. I like this, the character of Jabez. Large A, honorable means his reputation carried more weight than those around him. And I tell you what I think that was. I do think that was the way that he lived. He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life. Righteousness and the same Hebrew word, honor. If you seek and follow after righteousness, now this is going to become very important in our recipe for making lemonade out of sorrow. And how we're going to take those things that have maybe happened in this past year, maybe in our life, or those things that await for us in 2020, and how we're going to do it, number one, you got to have the right character. Because the character that you have will determine what that sorrow will end up becoming. It says here also, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and, same word, honor, and life. He carries a lot of weight around here because of his righteousness, because of his character. Look at B if you would. He made a name for himself that had value. Now, we'll talk about mom in just a moment, but to call her son sorrow had to be difficult. But let me tell you something. Because of the character of Jabez, because of the type of person that Jabez was and the righteousness that he lived by and the things that he did that were right, when you heard the name Jabez, you didn't think sorrow. You thought success. You thought, hey, the name Jabez is mentioned in the time that he lived. It was a name that, oh, yeah, there's a guy who does right. Man, there's a guy you can count on. There is value in his name. And I will tell you, whatever your past has been, maybe this year is a year to change your name or shall we say change your character. Listen to this quote. If honesty, humility, and holiness does not carry sorrow, sorrow will burn through and destroy the vessel it's in. Now this is very, very important to understand. The way that you live your life and the character that you have will determine how you will handle the sorrow that will come in 2020. There's gonna be evil that comes. Even Jabez doesn't pray for no evil. He prays that he won't be grieved by it 
And that's going to be dependent upon your character, your humility, your honesty, your holiness. And I can't think of three words that we need more. By the way, think of that first word there, honesty. Boy, we live in a deceitful world. I do not know of a word that's needed more today than honesty. Telling the truth. Thou shall not bear false witness. Our world is so deceitful. You can't get the truth out of anyone. In 2020, be an individual that tells the truth that's honest, that your yay means yay and your nay means nay. Don't bear false witness by holding back things. If there is an area of your life that we all in America need to work on, it is in the area of truthfulness and being honest. And I wanna tell you, as the Dean of Students at West Coast Baptist College, we could use some lessons on honesty as well. So it's not just permeated and don't just leave it in the political realm. I'm telling you, just in Lancaster, be honest and be truthful in your dealings and in what you say. That character will help you through the difficult times that you're going to face. The next word I love too is humility. I think Jabez is a very humble man. I think we're going to see this in his petition in just a few moments, in his calling uh, on the Lord. But I think his humility, that he didn't think, humility is not thinking bad of yourself. Humility is not thinking of yourself. This prayer is not about Jabez being successful. This prayer is for the glory of God. That humility and that pride, or that, that pride that we so often rise up and say it's our my way or the highway, or I'm right, or we don't listen to anyone else, will not do us well in 2020. Will not do us well when we have sorrow. And then holiness, just living God-like, being godly in our kindness and in the way we handle things. If honesty, humility, and holiness does not carry sorrow. Sorrow will burn through and destroy the vessel that it's in. I have a 2011 Camry, and I do not know to this day why this is in the trunk. Well, I do know, I know how I use it. But it, when you open up my trunk, off to the left, there is a little plastic slot I don't know if some tool bag was supposed to get the, in there or what, whatever it was or uh, the tools to, to, to change the tire are underneath the cover of the, of the trunk. So I don't know what it is, but I have found something. It is absolutely the size of a crate of eggs. So whenever I go to the store and I buy eggs, I put those eggs in my trunk in that little slot. And do you know what? I have never once come home with a broken egg. Because that little, it's the little egg carrier that the Toyota company put in the trunk. <laughs> and I put my dozen of eggs and it fits absolutely perfect in there. And then I drive home and there's, I could be worried about this or that, but there's one thing I'm not concerned about at all is my eggs will crack. Not one egg has ever cracked because it's in the right container. I want to share this with you. Some of you carried sorrow this past year in not a good container. And the sorrow really affected you. And you can't get through it. The grief, the sorrow. You know the greatest container to put sorrow in is the container of character. Because if you're living right, it is amazing how that sorrow takes on a different light. Some of you are still sucking the sour lemons of 2019 and you've never made lemonade with it. Can I tell you what will do that? Will be the character of your life.
Jabez was more weighty than all of his brethren. And his mother called his name Sorrow, saying, because I bear him with sorrow. Now, uh, there's just no explanation of what that was. But there are some interesting points. Number one, he's the only one in these six and a half chapters that doesn't have a father mentioned. Why is the mother saying this? You just kind of wonder that maybe during the pregnancy, maybe sometime near the delivery, that somehow dad died. Or there wasn't a father to be found. Maybe it's an illegitimate. I don't know. But whatever it is, because by the way, no mother in here would ever claim that they didn't have sorrow in the bearing of their child. Oh, no. If you go through labor, you have sorrow, and it's difficult. So we know that it can't mean just the bearing of a child, because every mother would know, well, listen, lady, I don't know who you think you were, but that goes with the curse. So it's got to be something else. And it's very possible that she lost her husband and Jabez was born without a dad and there's no dad mentioned whatsoever. But whatever the sorrow was in Jabez's life, he's going to turn that around. He's not going to let his mother calling him this name affect him. And I think that's because of his character. You know, we talk so much about so many things in our Christian life. But we just need to develop our character and to do what's right at the right appointed time. Number two, the confusion over Jabez. The confusion. And you know, I don't want to talk bad about a mother, but there is some confusion in Jabez's mom. And I tell you why I think that there is. Why would you call your son sorrow? That he's going to live with that name for the rest of his life. What were you thinking, mom? And I think mom was confused because of the sorrow that she bare Jabez in, whatever it was. Look with me, if you would, at the confusion over Jabez. Don't allow the sorrows of today to dictate the successes that could be tomorrow. Some of you can't move on. And I think Jabez's mother was willing to say, you're going to be called Jabez. Because every time I look at you, I'm going to remember the sorrow that occurred when you were born or around your birth or whatever it was. By the way, they didn't, they didn't name children till eight days, a young man till eight days when he was circumcised. That's when they did it. So she had eight days to think about a name. And in those eight days of thinking about a name for her newborn son, she comes up with the name Jabez. Now, before I'm not going to condemn her, I'm not going to call this, the, the, uh, this point the, con the condemnation of Jabez. I'm going to call it the confusion over Jabez. Because I think mom is a little bit confused about some things. Look at B if you would. We are too quick to call a tough time or crisis a Jabez. Now, I want everyone to stop on this because I'm leading up to something on this point that may be your takeaway for this day. I think we are too often, too quick to call a Jabez in our life a Jabez. That we have something happen in our life and oh, there's a terrible, oh, this is terrible. Oh, this is, this is oh, I'm not going to make it through this year. Oh, this is, I can't believe this just happened in our family. And I think we're too quick. And she was too quick to call her son Jabez. First Thessalonians chapter four and verse 13, the reason why under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica, is found in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It says that she, I would not rather have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. You, didn't, you thought Christ was going to come back before anyone would die in your church. And now people are dying in the church of Thessalonica. And I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. And then he says this incredible statement. Church of Thessalonica, 
that ye sorrow not as those that have no hope. Okay, you're going to sorrow because a person in your church that you love, you're not going to see again on this earth. Christ hasn't come back right away, so we haven't been all gathered together. So you're going to miss that loved one, you're going to miss that friend, and there's going to be sorrow. But sorrow not as those that have no hope. I think mom's a little confused about some things. I think mom is confused that whatever occurred was going to dictate now that there's no hope anymore. That I'm hopeless now with whatever happened around Jabez's birth. In her life, she was confused. All right, there's nothing now. It doesn't matter now. No, no, no. That we sorrow not as those that have no hope. Listen to this one. Don't make decisions based on appearance. Oh, we are so often to do this. Now, we have two really cool verses I can't wait to get to. And they're in your, in your book or in your little handout, so you could just keep that. But could I ask you to do something today? Would you take your Bible that you have with you that you brought to church and turn it? And take it to Genesis chapter 37 for just a moment. Well, Brother Shelton, the verse is right in the handout. Don't let the handout ever be a substitute for you taking your Bibles and turning and using it. And God's people said, no, I really mean it. Praise God for the handouts we have. But don't let that be a substitute for you using your Bible in church, okay? And this one you're going to want to mark. So the boys come back, they got to figure out some way to explain Joseph being gone, their brother. They sold Joseph as a slave. So they came up with this idea, hey, let's take his coat of many colors, dip it in, let's kill a goat, dip it in the goat's blood, show dad, and say, hey, dad, I don't have no idea what happened to your son. I don't know what's going on with our brother. Oh, they completely deceived him and everything, their dad. Of course, Jacob is reaping what he sowed. He's reaping more than he sowed. He's reaping later than he sowed. He deceived his father as well. But that's another message. Look at verse 32. And they sent the coat of many colors. So the boys bring back Joseph's coat, <coughs> which they have sprinkled with goat's blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, hey, look what we found out there. This have we found. Know not whether it be thy son's coat or no. Well, obviously. But listen and look at verse 33. And if you've never seen this, and I need your help actually to finish the verse. And he knew it. <gasps> Jacob looks at this coat, it's Joseph's. This is the coat of authority, the coat of many colors. And he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. By the way, is that true or false? Is that Joseph's coat, true or false? True, true. And an evil beast hath devoured him. Is that true or false? That's false. Now listen to this next statement. Matter of fact, we're all gonna say it together. Would all of you with me join with finishing the verse with the word Joseph, everyone together? Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Everyone together, is that true? Is Joseph dead or alive? Everyone, is he dead or alive? No, no, you didn't read your scripture. It says Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Was Joseph run in pieces? Jacob says without a doubt he's run in pieces. And I say to you, church, things are not always the way that they appear. Now you hear this. Because in 2020, there will be things that will come in your life that appear a certain way. And you have got to take that lemon and make lemonade. You have got to take that sorrow and make success out of it. Things are not always the way that they appear. Well, that marriage is done. Don't believe that. That child is gone. Don't believe that. I want to share this. 
She is confused because she is making decisions based on appearance at that moment. Why did you call your son sorrow? Because that's the way it looked in my life right then. Well, don't do that. Don't base your decisions upon what you immediately see. Wow, so important. By the way, we're in Genesis, so let's, rip up, let's turn on over real quick over to chapter 42. This comes up again just before he finds out that Joseph is alive. Look, look at verse 36. Uh, Genesis 42, verse 36. And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye ber bereaved, by the way, guess what word that is? Yebez, of my children. Joseph is not. That's not true. He's more alive than you could ever imagine. He's the Lord. He's living. He loves you. He's longing. And man, he's loaded, okay? Joseph is not. And Simeon is not. That's not true either. And ye will take Benjamin away. And then listen to this. All, and I think this is exactly the way Jeb, Jabez's mother felt. All these things are, everyone together, last two words. Amen. No, they weren't. Do you have any idea what God is doing through the life of Joseph right now? He is going to be your savior and the savior of the world. But right now, it looks like everything is against me. Was that your 2019? There was a 12 day period this past fall that I sat up in my office and felt like everything was against me. I don't believe that was true, but that was the way. I was starting to make decisions based upon the appearance that I saw. I just wanna encourage you, church family. Don't make decisions on what you're seeing with these eyes. Make your decisions by what you see by faith and hope into what God has. I think she's confused. Large D, confusion in our lives is inevitable when the present and temporal become dominant over the future and the eternal. Confusion in our lives will be inevitable when the present and the temporal become dominant over the future and the eternal. Okay, Brother Schiller, so what do you do? I have a two-point outline. Wait on the Lord and weigh out the facts. So if you're going through a Jabez moment in your life, Wait on the Lord. I love Psalm 27, and I love the last two verses of Psalm 27. I had fainted. I'd have given up. I'd have quit. I'd have thrown the towel in. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wow, what a verse. Church, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Don't put a judgment on 2019 yet, friend. Well, we got about two more days. No, no. You may find that the sorrows of 2019 turn out to be the greatest successes of 2020. You may find that the things that you thought were terrible of 2019 may end up being the greatest things that changed your life. Wait on the Lord. And then number two, and I like it, weigh out the facts. I have a, I have a mathematical formula for you. Impulsiveness plus impetuousness equals confusion. If you are impulsive and you are impetuous, chances are you're living a very confused life. Weigh out the facts. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is a hasty spirit exalteth folly. Wow. Weigh out the facts before you make a determination. It's a Jabez. Then number three, and this really is the message, but we'll go through it quickly. The calling from Jabez. I love this prayer. In verse number 10, and Jabez, sorrow, called. Now that's interesting because it is the exact same word that mom called Jabez. 
Mother called, proclaimed, declared his name Jabez. Jabez proclaimed, declared on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast and that thy hand might be with me and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Whoa, the calling from Jabez. First of all, I want you to see the person he calls on. You know, we call on the wrong people. I've really learned that. I'm sorry, but I kind of live in a college world, in a teen world. I'm going tonight to fly out to do a youth conference in Raleigh, Durham, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So I kind of live in a young people's world. Can I tell you something about young people? They call on the wrong ones. They call on the clever, the cute, and the comfortable. And they do. And that's who they look for on their buddies. Those that are clever enough to help them. Those are cute enough, like, I just really like them. And those, I just feel comfortable, they're my friends. I'll tell you who we should call on. The covenant God, the creator God, and the compassionate God. That's who we should call on. Get on your hands and knees this year. And make sure you're calling on the right person. Call on the covenant God, because he's the only one that's going to make a promise that's going to be able to keep it. Call on the creator God. And by the way, we see all of that in that text there. First of all, call on the God of Israel. The very word Israel is, has to do with covenant, because that's what the name from Jacob to Israel was given when God made the covenant with Jacob about Israel. So the very word Israel, call on the God of Israel, was he's calling on the covenant God, the God that could fulfill the promise that he wanted. The word God there is Elohim, capital G, small o, small d. We find it in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. This God's going to be powerful enough to answer the request that I have. The covenant God, the creator God, and absolutely the compassionate God. Don't you love the way the verse ends? And God granted him that which he requested. Praise the Lord. We go to a God who does have compassion. We do go to the God who created the world. And we go to the God who keeps his promises. Notice the person he called on. Number two, and I really want to stress this this morning. Notice the passion Jabez calls with. Jabez is desperate. Jabez is devoted and Jabez is dependent entirely on God. I love this word, importunity, and I've preached on that here in having the prayer of importunity, a helpless, urgent consistency. I see that passion in Jabez's prayer. This isn't a little prayer that he prays on, um, at, 12, at, at 11.30 um, on December 31st, just before the new year. He gives this little prayer, God, be with me in 2020. No. This prayer has passion behind it. As far as I can tell, I know not of anyone in the scriptures that ever cried out to God that God did not answer their prayers. My favorite prayer verse in the Bible is Psalm 34, 6. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Lancaster Baptist, if I encourage you to do anything before this year is over, cry out to God. Not this little prayer, God, hey, Lord, you know, be with me this coming year. Give me some goals, Lord. No, but a desperate, devoted to the cause of Christ for the glory of God, a desperate, devoted, and dependent entirely on Christ's prayer. God, you got to do something. Lord, this has got to go from lemons to lemonade. For your name's sake, this has got to change. I can't live in this sorrow. Lord, help me out of this stupor, the passion Jabez calls with. But without a doubt, the key to this whole thing is the petition Jabez calls for. He calls out to the right person. He's got the right passion, and I cannot tell you how important that is. Oh, by the way, under the passion, I have to tell you something about my grandson. So... I have a little alliterated outline about Ryder already. The only thing that Ryder does in communication is cries. That's all he does. I mean, I was expecting 
at uh, two months that he would be able to say, I love you, Grandpa, but it's not there yet. I don't know what the problem is. So all Ryder can do is cry, and I've got this down. I was with Ryder for five days, six days, seven days, and all that kid did was cry. But I learned something. He's got three kinds of cries. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, and I got him alliterated. He's got the pity cry. And boy, do I see his dad in that one. <laughs> he's got the petty cry. Okay, he's got the petty cry. He's like, okay, there ain't nothing wrong with you, man. You're fooling, you got a dry diaper. Quit crying, okay? He's got the petty cry. He's just crying, all right? It's petty. He's got the little pity cry, but then he's got the passionate cry. Okay, now the passionate cry we always responded to. And you can tell it in the decibel level, and you can tell it in just the, the guttural back in the back. It's like, okay, something's wrong with Ryder. You know what? We didn't always respond to his pity cry. And I don't think Drew and Noel ever responded to his petty cry. But never did mom and dad not respond to his passionate cry. And I want to tell you, a lot of our prayers are petty and pitiful. But if you pray with passion... God will answer your prayers. Never will you cry out to God with passion that he, the Abba Father is a God. If Drew and Noel will answer writers' passionate prayers, I'm telling you something. God will answer your passionate prayers as well. And then I want to give you the petition and we're done. Remember, you didn't have Sunday school, so we can go a little longer. The petition. <laughs> the petition Jabez calls for. Number one, he asked for grace. Wow, what a great prayer. Oh, that thou would bless me. Well, Brother Shetler, that sounds kind of selfish. You know why? Our view of God's grace is so messed up in our American Christianity. Do you know that God gives us grace to be a blessing for others. God enables you with something and God gives you favor for something that you are to bless others with. I love Genesis chapter 12 and verse two, the Abrahamic covenant. And he says, I'm gonna bless you, Abraham. And because I'm gonna bless you and your nation, you're gonna be a blessing to others as well. We have been blessed to be a blessing to others. And Jabez has got this. God, give me favor, give me grace so that I can bless other people. I have a great assistant, his name is Tim Bundy. And sometimes a lot of things are happening in our office and I bring Tim in and we have prayer every morning together. And Tim and I sit, sometimes we share a scripture or something, and, and, and I talk to him a little bit. And every once in a while, when just things have been just buzzing in our office, I stop Tim and I say this to him. I say, Tim, I know you got a lot going on today. And I know there's just all these little detail things that's got to be done. But do know this, Tim, that if you get all those things done, that gives me more time I can minister to the college students. I can do more for the college students, Tim, if you do more for me. And boy, he's always right on board. Yes, Dr. Shetler, I got it. Can I tell you that's grace? God, would you bless me and give me your favor so that I could bless others? God, if you give me more grace and if you bless me, I can do more for other people. I love this prayer. He asked for grace. By the way, I think this prayer is a prayer list for, the, for 2020. Here's your prayer list. Ask for grace every day. Number two, he seeks for growth. I believe, from what I understand at this point, and I don't know a lot of other people would even know here, I believe this will be the most challenging vision Lancaster Baptist Church maybe has ever been given in 2020. You better start praying Jabez's prayer. Because what did Jabez pray for? That my coast and enlarge my coast. May I go where I've never gone before. Take me out of my comfort zone, God. 
Enlarge my coast. I want to grow. Those lemons I threw, I got a whole basket full of. You need some more lemons, let me know. You got a lemon tree? No, my brother does. And he lives in Phoenix. And I got to tell you, he just bought a new house. He's got three lemon trees, two orange trees, and a grapefruit tree. And they are loaded. I have never seen, you, there is more yellow than there is green on those trees. That is my kind of tree. You know what? The only thing that God cursed, the only thing that Jesus Christ cursed when he was on this earth was a tree that had leaves but no fruit. And I want to encourage you this year, ask God for fruit. Fruit that you've never seen before in your life. Enlarge your, 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 your boundaries, your borders. God, give me growth, but not just leaves. I don't need more leaves in my life. I don't need more programs and more busyness. That's all leaves. God, enlarge me, not with busyness, but with fruit. I could have thrown out a whole bucket full of lemons, let me tell you. And we could have taken as many lemons as our car could have carried. Because my brother's trees are full of growth. And that growth is fruit. He seeks for grace. He asks for grace. He seeks for growth. By the way, Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count out myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are in 2019 and reaching forth unto those things which are in 2020. It's all in the Greek. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That is Jabez's prayer as well. He begs for guidance. Don't you just love that little part there? And enlarge my coast and that thy hand might be with me. Guide me this year, will you, Lord? His hand might guide me, beside me. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God and give it to all, that give it to all men liberally and abradeth not and it shall be given him. That is the number one verse that's quoted in my, ver in my office every day when I do counseling. I never start a counseling session without praying, James 1.5. Beg for guidance. God, I need guidance in 2020. And then he pleads for goodness. I love this. Notice what he did. Now, you got to look at this verse, right? And that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. He didn't say, Lord, may I not have any evil in 2020. That is not what he prays. He prays, Lord, may I not have any evil that would, what's the next word? That would what? Grief. Let me teach you a Hebrew word today. Yebes. Yebes. Can you all say that word? Yes. That's the word for grieve there in that verse. Lord, I'm not asking that you take evil out of my life, but I am asking, Lord, that I will not have Jabez when the evil comes. God, I don't want to live out my name. Lord, I don't want to have grief. God, I don't want to have sorrow when these things come into my life. I want to take that and use that for you and look at how God and, and God granted him that which he requested. Wow. That's a great prayer for our church. In 2020, you better be holding on to Jabez's prayer when pastor on January 12th. Lord, we're going to need your grace. God. We need to grow. Lord, we're going to need guidance. And oh God, give us your goodness so that we can be a blessing to others. And there's the Genesis 2, 12 too. I close by telling you this. I encourage you today to come down to an altar and pray Jabez's prayer. Uh, you understand it now? Take the lemons of 2019 and say, dear God, I'm ready to start making some lemonade. And God, I'm going to take that which was sorrowful and that which was sour. And Lord, I'm going to recall. And God, I'm going to use this for your honor and your glory. God, I don't want a Jabez attitude. I don't want a Jabez life. I want to pray what Jabez prayed. God, for 2020, for the month of January, Lord, I pray 
that Jabez's prayer would be my prayer in what I desire. But I am going to share this. I prayed this at the beginning. One of the most profound things about this prayer is how short it is. It's 33 words. But you know, God answers short prayers. There's a thief on the cross and he says, remember me. And Jesus in his dying moments says, today thou will be with me in paradise. Amen. Hey, can I tell you this? If you're here today, you can say a short prayer, but the profoundness of that prayer and the response, matter of fact, I wrote it this way. The brevity of the prayer doesn't lessen the magnitude of God's response. Your prayer may be short and sweet, but his response can be powerful and mighty. You can, in one prayer, meaning it from your heart by faith, change a whole direction of your life and your, and your eternal destination. You ever think about that? In a short prayer, someone can go from hell to heaven. Now, it's not the prayer that saves you. It's the faith behind that prayer. When that thief says, remember me, he knew who he was next to. Peter says, how about this link to this prayer? This is a pretty long one. You already, I memorized Peter's prayer. Help me when he's sinking. And if you sense that you are on your way to the pit of hell and never have trusted Christ, cry out to God, God save me. And I love Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'll tell you a prayer that's better than Jabez's prayer. It's when a sinner comes to Jesus Christ by faith and says, God, would you save me? And if you're here today and you've never prayed the sinner's prayer, he could save you today.